going to dive in a bit more details about it related to virtual machines and, and sort of this is kind of kind of also <coughs> some proposals on, on how we could go forward and, 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 and collaborate also in this area because this room is full of people that would have a lot to contribute. So as <coughs> introduction this is this is maybe familiar to many of you who are involved with IT centers or, or either as a user or as an administrator. Uh, at least this is very familiar at CSC. So how, how do you go about maintaining software in a cluster? So, so the user logs into the cluster and, okay, I want to run, say, XR. Okay, let's try it. No, there's no XR available. Okay, so, well, that's easy. You just make a ticket. Please install XR, make it available in the cluster. Then you maybe wait for some time, two weeks. Then maybe appears, maybe right version or not. You you have to iterate maybe, and finally you have it there, and your the solution is delivered. And I, now I want to ask a question: That is this the way to work in, in 2015, where you, where you have sort of we are going strongly to the automation, and one admin is taking care of. 25,000 servers. You can imagine that this is the Facebook data center. It's not, it's, it's CSC, but, but we have copyright on for that, that image, so I use it. But that's, in this kind of world, is this model going to fly much longer? So I'm, I'm sort of claiming that the world is changing, and, and we, have to, we have to react on that. And, and as, as you are well aware, the bioinformatics code base is huge. Uh, it, it, it is definitely, I would imagine, the largest code base in science. So, so if you go to the physics conference, they have some... Th their IT problems are pretty small in the software area because you can always take, take some application and rewrite. Well, I know that that's not actually true. There are also huge applications in physics, but, but anyhow, it, uh, size difference is quite quite big. And this is for example when Hadoop Hadoop came then the, okay let's let's start to use Hadoop but for what we have this well, say one hundred thousand years worth of software that we are using in our pipeline. So how to convert Hadoop it's not it's not easy. But but one important point is that basically all of that software runs on Linux. So Sort of, it's, it's written on top of generic framework or common framework. And, and as you might know, a lot has been happening in, in that area. So there are package managers, they have been for a long time. Now we have virtual machines or hypervisors, so you can virtualize software. And as a later addition, also Linux containers and, 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 and things built on top of them like Docker are coming. So, Things are changing in that area, in, in sort of generic IT. And, and it, it could be that if bioinformatics community doesn't sort of react, then someday Amazon will be able to provide it all. Uh, that's not necessarily something. So, how to start to make your virtual machine exist? I'm, I'm using this word baking, which is not very common vocabulary, but it's not my own invention, so other people are also using it. So the basic way of creating virtual machine images is sort of doing it manually, like baking. <coughs> you bake your cake, put all stuff into it, and, and finally it's done. So, so what you are creating is a virtual machine image. You, you put up a massive install what you need, Operating system, the applications, libraries, data sets, maybe, and, and then save a snapshot as a virtual machine image. So, what, what you essentially get is something like this. So, a bundle could look actually the other way around, not the way in the world, but anyhow, operating system, then you have libraries, reference data, tools, and then maybe some user interfaces and command lines, and everything is bundled as a virtual machine. So, this is familiar, I hope, I think, for most of you. And now, I, I put this this rolling pin picture here, 
because it sort of very well gives the idea that I, I'm, I want to I want to sort of show so you it's very manual and, and, and not very automated what you are doing so so there are some limitations because of that so first thing is that if you want to have parallel versions so say you are installing software on Ubuntu Linux and then you want to support CentOS also but well, then it's then you have to bake again you have to make another cake uh, then when you have updates the operating system is updating all the time it's it's quite a lot of pain it's not a manual operation so more making and also because you are manually adding stuff you are making mistakes you are correcting them there's also more degradation happening on your virtual machine needs so it won't last forever and of course because you're doing manually there's place for errors and and, and also place on top of easy to make security issues. So the other way of creating virtual machines is then this more automated approach. So so it's, it's been called bootstrapping by some people. So the idea is that you have plain image to start with and then automate the the whole sort of installation process. So this is this was very good found from from internet or creative commons. So the you have if you if you know this vocabulary bootstrapping idea that you just lift yourself up from from your bootstraps. So you have nothing empty image and then you just image it in itself automatically installs everything. And it's automated so it's a, it's basically a robot that you are building. And, and as you can Imagine it's, it's not as easy. So baking is something that you can just take a machine and start to install stuff into it and, and then when you are done, you save it. But this is automated process, so so it requires more technical technical skills. But if you are seriously doing virtual machines, so so for example provi providing a software or software environment as a sort of production quality thing, then I would say that bootstrapping is the way to go because with bootstrapping you can overcome the limitations of baking so you can create easily simultaneous versions for example different Linux flavors of like big image that has everything small image that is use, useful for maybe training or some limited limited uh, use cases and it can be all automated and then when you are creating this automation then of course the probability of something failing increases a lot so so especially when you are installing third party stuff <coughs> always some download server will be down so when you are going to this direction you have to add automated testing into your system so so if, if the image creation is automated it should be also automatically tested or otherwise it will just fail at some point and then you have no idea that what's the What's the sort of reason for the failure? Because the error was done earlier, and, and there's no sort of connection to <coughs> what failed. And still, creating ready to run, baking in all of this is, is still useful if you want to improve your startup time. So, so you don't have to run the bootstrap process all the time. So, that what I would sort of like to see happening in bioinformatics is that we would have, have this new kind of approach by creating virtual machines and also being quite le clever on how to create those machines. So sort of building factories that spit out virtual machines and, and, and they would take care that everything that comes out of the factory is tested. So there's a set of functional tests and, and and if the machine is coming out then it has passed all the tests and also security testing so it will take the best security scanners available at the moment and run them against the machine so at least it's not super easy to get into them and of course always install well, not maybe latest but at least for the, the freezing enough software <coughs> and 
there's no denying it that this is not an easy thing to do. No. But but it could be sort of it should be a collaboration. Because the same word famous in the image could serve a lot of people. So so after all it's it's basically the same software stacks that we are using or similar. And then, if we had something like this, then virtual machines as sort of basic unit of bioinformatics work could be widely used, <coughs> known. And <coughs> bioinits.org that we just saw is a good in initiative. And for the record, I have been pushing these kind of ideas in that direction. But for some reason, they wanted to get it done first, <laughs> and then, then increase into more, more of the demanding scenarios. But, but still, the message here is that one good image is better than and thousands or thousands of poorly made ones because poorly made images are very, they can, well, someone cracks into them and, and you will lose your stuff, so they are more of a problem than a solution. So the vision would be that because it is relatively easy to install most of the bioinformatics software databases into one Linux box. So why won't we just have not necessarily all of bioinformatics, but large portions of bioinformatics software available as a pretty environment that you can just take and start to use. So it's like Spotify, you can just, I want to listen to whatever Bruce Springsteen today. And most of it is there, of course not everything. So, on our background, we have been doing this, especially with Zipster, also in some uh, in other other cases. But Zipster is more more demanding than everything else combined and multiplied by three. So, so Zipster has about 350 analyzed tools, and it's 200 gigabytes. So you can imagine that that maintaining is horrible. So, when we started, we started actually on on. A, Solaris machine, first version of chips that was running on there. And, and I can just remember that the idea, when the machine went away and we had to install everything again, and, and the, the next machine at CSC wasn't Solaris, it was Linux. So it was, it was really an adventure of struggle to get, get all of the software running again. <coughs> and, and of course, then when people started to ask me, can we have chips to run in our environment? Okay, yes, you can. You just need to make this effort of what, six person months to install everything. And that usually wasn't considered as a nice thing. So we, we made this virtual machine mix manually, so it's just by baking, using this terminology, and, and, and the problem was solved. But then we get got another problem because Sooner, not soon, but at some point the image became old. It needed updating, and and well, that update wasn't hard. so easy <coughs> how to rebake everything. So we saw that okay, this is now time to do some DevOps magic and, and create sort of image building process or factory that keeps keeps the image up to the time. So. The tool chain that we are now running starts from GitHub. When you do commit into GitHub, Jenkins will get get notification. Will start a build build a process using some of our own Python code and Ansible. So pretty simple, pretty simple tools. It will operate our cloud uh, cloud environment, which is OpenStack based, and then use the cloud first to build the machine and then to deploy it on the cloud. And finally, if it's if it's a production machine, then it will run on certain set of tests. And, and if they fail, then this OpsU monitoring system will actually complain, and, and then someone will call us or we will get email or whatever, depending on the time. And, and when we started in the first version of this automated system, it was two days of building to get the whole thing done. Of course, we can always do a complete rebuild. But then we spent some time optimizing it, and, and it's now done to one hour, so it's already 
it could be even more if you could parallelize R installations or R package installations. But still, it's already good enough, at least for now. <coughs> and the end result is that now we are able to provide easy to use and reliable images to people, and, and it means that more people are installing the system. It's still not always painless for us, but but we are sort of taking the hit on behalf of our users, so, which I hope that would, of course, of course, be be the approach that one one sort of place is creating one image is actually a lot of effort is put is put into it, so then then it can be used by thousands of other people. So, if for example, if you have this is this is our user interface, there's, there's been some XR. Uh, oh, we are viewing XR results here. And just so that, okay, there is user, user interface, which is, it is run XR, which is running on top of R by your conductor, and that's running on top of the operating system. And this is just a very simplified version. There's a lot more layers and uh, dependencies and things. And, and all of this is bundled into a virtual machine, so you can edit and start it. and then user inter interface is there. And also very important point, okay, everything is bundled, but also everything is updated. So so you can always build it once, but when you have to start to maintain and update everything and, and still keep it synchronized, then, then that's the real challenge. And we are trying to solve it, solve it once and then just distribute the other people and have our automatic test systems hit the image all the time. One thing that's, that's problematic in this image business is data sizes. So typically the idea is that images should be something like <coughs> 4 gigabytes, anyhow less than 10. Uh, if not, then you, you usually run into trouble. We have been discovering this a lot with our huge 200 gigabyte images. So it's a good idea to keep your root image small. And then if you have a lot of data and tools, then they may go separate parties and busy and find a way to distribute that. So the obvious thing is NFS, which is what we are using at CSC to distribute our tools and databases. But also when we are working with this EGI Fed Cloud people right now started it, they are also sort of looking at the same kind of solution as federated in, in Europe. And then very exciting thing is this CERN VM file system, which sort of it would solve all of the problems and everything would be fine and dandy. But we are, haven't still have tried that to actually do so. And, and uh, the developers said that at least you are going to have problems with big files. So for example, reference genomes will be problematic. I won't go into details about containers, just to point out that virtual machines are not the end of the technical development here, but, but Linux containers are coming. They are more likely better solution for mini bioinformatics software than virtual machines are, but I would say that go on to virtual machines now and, and look into this <coughs> while loop following this development. So summarize the big point is that more quality and less quantity so if you if you need small virtual machine for some particular task then it's all right to do it but in whatever way you want but when you start to use virtual machines as a mean of deliver, delivering software as sort of as a production level service then you have to increase your level of, of automation and, and sort of quality control. And I would see this as a good opportunity for collaborative effort. So for example, NAIC could fund it. Now that you are speaking there, so so that there would be some some well maintained bioinformatics virtual machines available that are constantly updated and tested and security tested and so on. It can't be done by one single lab, I would say, probably, but it could be done by reasonable collaboration. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> One quick question, Samuel. Yeah, have you summarized your knowledge that you've gained from uh, from developing this uh, kind of VM factory somehow? Are you thinking of writing a book or a handbook or something? Not or really, books. Not really. So the summary is is the summary <laughs> here. But <laughs> no, we haven't. Of course, that could be useful. I was also wondering about Vagrant. If you have looked at it and why we didn't use that. We we have looked into it. Um, I don't know why they chose not to use it. Uh, one thing is that we try to get our tool chain simple, simple. So Python and Ansible is quite simple. Python is well, every, everything that you add on top of it or below or in between them or complicated. So, for example, we chose not to use Jeff or Puppet for this reason. A comment from you. Yeah, you mentioned security. Mm -hmm. Is that even important? Uh, we all know that old virtual machine images suck. They, they're yeah. all worthless. <coughs> yeah. Use a, a, give a few months from, from now. The, these old machines, they have port bleed, they have a bash, yeah. security flow, a number exactly. of root exploits. So it's really down to the cloud provider that going to run these images to ensure that these images can wreak havoc in the environment where they put, <coughs> put loose. Yeah. So uh, should we even care about security when we make cloud images like this? Well, yeah. You should in a way that it is, it's your stuff, what's in there, it will be cracked and, and destroyed. And if it, if it's sensitive, it's an issue. So for example, in our cloud, we have seen this that at one point, some of the machines just start to generate a lot of traffic into China. That's usually the sign that, okay, kill it. <laughs> Let the user know that your machine has been, has been sort of taken over. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, it's, uh, we, we also always, I think we confuse sometimes that, that virtual machines is for service provisioning only. And I mean, we forget that many people, they download a virtual machine and they run it on their own computer, for example, an educational course. They can unplug the internet cable or something like that. And sure, you have to trust it, but it's not, I mean, hardly like it's yeah. probably not as important. Okay, thank you, Alexi, and we move on.